I'm sitting in the back of the conference room and uh, the entire audience is applauding as someone is presenting my work. Now, I need some practice from you because this is a very interactive audience. So everybody say, ooh. Everybody say, ah. Everybody clap your hands. Woo. Now stop because I realized the audience was not clapping for me. My partner, who I worked together for nine months, was presenting. Half of the slides were mine, and she left my name off of the slide deck. As the sun shone down through the windows, there was a tear I was trying to pull back. You see, the reason why someone else was presenting my work was that I grew up with a severe a severe stutter, and it forced me to find ways to hide my shame. True, I, I was ashamed of myself for most of my life. And the fact that she was able to get away with that was the worst part of it. I told my manager, I told his manager, I said, why, why can you do something about this? And, and they told me, no, Roger, everybody knows your contribution. Everybody knows how hard you worked. Meanwhile, she put my name on the last page of the slide deck saying thanks to the department. Um, over the years, I would notice that people like me would get marginalized. And I'm going to change that uh, a narrative right now. You see, being a first a, a, a generation Indian in America, I was born in Bombay but raised here in America. I tried to take the best of two cultures, but when I was seven years old, I went to my first uh, 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 school where we moved to in the suburbs. I had moved away from all of my diverse friends where we played together every single day, no matter the race, color, background, or religion, it, it didn't matter. We moved to the suburbs and now I was, oh, there's that Indian kid that can't talk right. Um, when I went to recess, the kids, didn't want to play soccer with me. I loved soccer. So I said, you know what? I'm not going to move from this field until one of your teams picks me to play soccer. They finally begrudgingly said, okay, fine, go. So as I run out onto the field, and I race out like Usain Bolt, and then I make my first slide tackle, whoo, and then the ball goes careening over the field, blocking my first goal. The kids finally said, oh, wow, this kid can play. This kid can play. We don't care how he talks. I finally felt like I belonged. You see, over 10% of the US population has some sort of a speech impediment. A lisp, a stammer, a stutter, a, 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 some sort of a speaking a difficulty or challenge. And if you include people that are um, English as second language speakers or have a heavy accent, it's even more. And all these people are hiding because they feel trapped in this box of fear and they can't get out. Because sometimes that box is made by the people around you, sometimes it's made by yourself, isn't it? Raise your hand if, if you've ever trapped yourself in a box. Yeah. And sometimes that mental box is stronger than anything else, isn't it? But it's not until you take that box and you break out of it, and now you can finally get comfortable getting uncomfortable, because now that's where your greatest success lies, doesn't it? Over the years, I would try to find different ways to hide my disability. You'll hear me all the time. My pacing, my words are not the same. I'm balancing. I'm trying to find different ways to speak. But as the, uh, bu 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 as, as, as the uh, bu uh, bullying I I I I intensified, I had to find something else that could make me speak uh, uh, more fluently. I remember in middle school, at the end of a assembly, I was at the end of the line, which was bad news for me, because three kids decided to push me in the stairwell and, and, and take turns beating me up. And when I walked to the class, the teacher asked me, why are you late to class, Raja? I held back a tear, and I said, oh, I'm sorry I tripped. All the playground, you can't say anything about it, right? So the teachers knew, the kids knew, but nobody did anything. 
I knew if I stayed in that sort of mindset, I would never survive my life. I deserved more. Every single one of you deserves more, don't you? And you have to fight for it. But I didn't know how. Until, as luck would have it, that weekend, I watched the 1984 movie, The Karate Kid. Woo! Here was a kid just like me who got moved to a new school like me. Here was a kid that got picked on and bullied by a group of people like me. And here was a kid that got physically beat up because he was uh, a different like me. I went to my mom. I said, Mom, Mom, please, please, can I take karate? She said, Beta, no, it's an emergency, like they're going to hurt you. <laughs> oh, my dreams of becoming Bruce Lee or Chuck Norris were dashed. So instead, I went to this next best source. Dad? <laughs> Dad, can we please go check out the karate school? And he replies back in his normal stoic voice, OK, Beta, we'll see. So we go to the karate school. It is an hour and a half, <laughs> hour and a half long class, and I'm sold after five minutes that this is a life-changing event for me. Just like in Karate Kid, where he stood up to the bullies, I knew I could do the same thing. So my dad signed me up for a year, and I began my training. Yes. You see, one thing I learned about karate is that it is not about fighting. It's really not. Anybody that ever takes martial arts or is anticipating taking martial arts, it's not about fighting. It's about learning to become the next version of you. And that's what it was for me, to transform into something different in you. I learned, I trained. Five years later, I earned my black belt. And my teacher said, well, Mr. Vadia, uh, now you're black belt. You have to help teach class. What, wait, what? I have, to, I have to teach class? I didn't sign up for that. You kidding me? I did karate so I could hide my speech. I didn't want to talk. But because I was a black belt, I had to. So I started teaching and opening every single class with the five, six, uh, seven-year-olds. Have you taught kindergartners before? It, 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 it's, it's worse than doing heart surgery, I'm telling you. Um, uh, you, you the, these, uh, 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 the children have no filter. They tell you right away, they roll their eyes right away, they also giggle and laugh right away. You can't blame them, and you just got to look back and say, well, what can we do? So here's what I did. I used my body as my words. Get up! Look at me. Get up! Follow me! Get up! Next move! Nice and slow. The kids listened. I learned that by using my body language, I could affect change and I can make people listen to me. You see, the one thing that karate taught me was that I had to face that fear. So I would also find other ways to hide that fear too. For example, I got into music. I love singing. Anybody else here love singing? Yes? Oh, I see a lot of hands up here. Fantastic. Now, I know that this is the lunch cloud and all of you have phlegm in your uh, throat now, but you're gonna have to sing with me, okay? Because like, I always need help. Um, so. Uh, in ninth grade, I got into the choir, and I started to realize I had a good ear. I learned to play Phantom of the Opera on the piano, so I self-taught on the piano. Then by 10th grade, I, I, I tried out for our touring choir, and I made it. By 11th grade, I got into the district choir. And then by senior year of high school, I started to take, take it seriously. You know what? Maybe I could actually become a music major. Maybe I could do something with this music. Uh, I got into uh, districts. I got 14th out of 40. And then after that, they only take the top 20 from each of the districts for the next round. Unfortunately, at the time, anybody have braces? Raise your hand if you had braces. I got a bite plate. So I actually sing like this at the auditions. So not only couldn't talk, I couldn't breathe either. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to find a way around that, too, right? Jim Rohn says that don't wish that your obstacles were easier. Wish that you were uh, better. So I found a way. How can I get uh, uh, better? I practiced more. I practiced after school. I asked the choir teacher, can you please help me with voice lessons or something? And I begged my orthodontist and my parents, please take the bite plate out so I could breathe properly. 
But I realized when I went to auditions that that bite blade being taken out, the fact that I was forced to audition with that in the first round may have helped me, but I wasn't sure because they only take the top 10 out of 80 in the next round. And then after that, they take four out of 160 for state. But the odds were against me, weren't they? So after auditions, we're waiting there in the auditorium with 100 or so kids. Everybody is waiting to find out their ranking. All right, number 10, number nine, still not me. Number eight, not me. I'm looking at my watch. Number seven, six, five. Oh, great. I didn't make it. Number three, number two, number one, Roger Vadia. But wait, what? What? I, I had jumped from out of 80 children to number one in my voice part. And that took me to all state in Pennsylvania. I could not believe it. So part of my growth was realizing that sometimes you have to believe it and become it. Say that with me. Believe it and become it. <laughs> Truly. Because all of us here have the opportunity to grow, to believe, to become the next version of you. This is not just a story about invisible disabilities, but it's also a story of growth. See, when you look at this here, this is me speaking every single day. I'm walking like I'm on a parking bumper. I'm trying to balance, even right now. And I'm wobbling and I might fall off. Meanwhile, the person, the average person next to me, that's my son, is just walking along the parking lot and he's just passing me while I'm struggling to speak. You see, it looks more like this where I'm alone and sometimes my next word, I don't know if I'm gonna make it. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. So that belief of maybe I can make it it's so pervasive every single day of my life. You have to become an optimist and to hope that this all goes. And as we think about what happens in life, you heard in my cancer research job where I've been working for 26 years, that last manager took advantage of me and got away with it. Why? Because under the Americans with a Disabilities Act, there is no protections for speech disfluency. There is for, for people who are blind, who are deaf, people who are mute. The closest thing to speech disfluency I found was mental health illness. That is not what I have. I have a challenging time speaking sometimes. That's all. Right? But the content is there. It's kind of like you got your, you have your, uh, sp uh, sp uh, uh, sp uh, your, your uh, Spotify list, uh, but your Bluetooth speaker just needs a little bit of improvement. Right? That's all it is. So, when I got into singing and now I can present myself in any way that I want, you know, it gave me power to believe that I could be impactful, that I had value. So when I sing along with here, sing along with me if you can, right? Tore ador hongare, tore ador, tore ador. Et songe bien, we songe en combato. I had finally found some value. See, by speaking and singing, I found that I didn't need something else. I found that I had value exactly as I am. You see, when, I, when the National Institute of Health uh, interviewed people with speech disfluencies, they were asked how many of them think that their speech affects their job or their, or, or their, prom, or their promotabil, pr, promotability. 70% said yes. 70% feel boxed in and marginalized. And you now have the opportunity to help break that cycle. I would love to challenge everybody out there that is a team leader or knows anyone suffering from an invisible disability, talk to them, connect with them. If you see someone who's blind, don't dismiss them because maybe they are the smartest person in the room and they can type the fastest. If you see someone who's hearing impaired, maybe they're the most organized. If you see someone who is speech impaired, maybe they are the one that has the best communication in the entire room. You don't know. But if you give them a chance, you will find out that you have someone of great talent. So when we talk about DEI issues, 
diversity, equity, inclusion. Remember, people with invisible disabilities are being left out. So even currently right now, in your companies, in your associations, in your families, in your homes, in your church, in your community groups, somebody is screaming in quiet frustration and you don't know because you don't hear their voice. I would like to give them that voice. So for every single one of out here, your call to action is very simple. I'd like every single one of you, find someone who is challenged and give them a voice. I'm Coach Raja, the kickboxing, singing, cancer scientist. Believe it and become it.